I would like to warmly welcome you all to the launch of this remarkable, groundbreaking book, Being Hindu in Bangladesh, The Untold Story, by Deep Haldar and Avishek Biswas. Before we discuss the book, I will introduce the authors and the book very briefly. May I please request you all to please take your seats. So just to briefly introduce the book that we are launching today. Even as a great mass of humanity moved from the east to the west of Bengal to settle in Hindu majority India during partition, scores of people were left behind. Where are they today? In the land that was once East Bengal, which became East Pakistan in 1955 and then Bangladesh in 1971. According to a recent estimate by the Bangladesh Bureau of Statistics, there were 17 million Hindus in Bangladesh. Since the rise of Islamist political formations in the country during the 1990s, many were threatened or attacked, and substantial numbers are fleeing the country for India even today. Despite their dwindling numbers, Hindus wield considerable influence in Bangladesh because of their concentration in areas such as Gopal Ganj, Dinajpur, Silhet, Sunam Ganj, Maiman Singh, Khulna, Jessore, Chittagong, and parts of Chittagong's hill tracts. They form the majority of the electorate in at least two parliamentary constituencies and account for more than 25% in another 30, often making them the deciding factor in parliamentary elections where victory margins can be extremely narrow. Politics aside, the syncretic culture that had brought Hindus and Muslims in East Pakistan together during the Liberation War of 1971 still exists, as do frequent attacks on Hindu lives and property. In this book, Deep Haldar and Avishek Biswas attempt to sift out the truth from the statistics through the extensive study of archival material, records, and on-ground research in Bangladesh, they piece together the lived experience of the Hindus in the country. In the process, they find answers to important questions about the nature of identity, its connection with religion, and ultimately, the very idea of home. The authors don't need an introduction, but I will still very briefly introduce them. Deep Haldar has been a journalist for more than 20 years, writing on issues of development at the intersection of religion, caste, and politics. He is the author of Blood Island and Bengal 2021. Avishek Biswas is Assistant Professor of English Literature at Vidya Sagar College, Calcutta University. He has a PhD from Jadavpur University and works on oral narratives of partition history. To launch the book this evening and to discuss it, we have a very distinguished panel, and I would now like to invite Mr. Shekhar Gupta and Mr. Sanjeev Sanyal to formally introduce themselves and release the book. Hi, I'm Sanjeev Sanyal. I'm a writer and economist, and I'm particularly pleased to be here. Yeah, over to you. I'm Shekhar Gupta, I'm a journalist. <clears throat> and I'm founder of The Print, and Deep Haldar is among my stellar cast of columnists. So should we just stand up and yes, do the please, honors? Please, please. Okay. Thank you very much. I would now like to invite noted Bangladesh expert, Dr. Ayanjit Sen, to please say a few words. Thank you, ma'am. Um, Sanil sir, Shekhar sir, and of course my brother, Deep Haldar, and uh, the person on the extreme left of, comes from my hometown as well. So uh, congratulations to you both uh, for this because 
uh, I'd been a frequent visitor to uh, different parts of Bangladesh as a journalist and post that uh, as a part of media di uh, diplomacy uh, strategy. And uh, the current situation as of now today, if, I'm, uh, if I can say that, uh, the picture outside is around the world is a pretty uh, goody goody one, of course, with a uh, good amount of uh, so called uh, quotient of sec secularism that's uh, out there. But the picture inside, on, in, in the ground itself, as uh, Deep would also agree with me, I'm sure, is uh, still not that clear and not that rosy, so, so to say. And uh, I've had chat with uh, different government uh, functionaries of uh, Bangladesh and uh, things are going better, no doubt, but uh, I think there's still a lot to be done by the government of Bangladesh uh, in this regard because there have been sporadic incidents of uh, violence that have erupted, not, and we're not talking about the capital Dhaka, but uh, especially in different parts of uh, Bangladesh, even up till Chittagong as well. And a recent inc incident happened a few days back and uh, where uh, I think a few people were uh, roughed up and uh, one was even uh, uh, closed. He kind of, he, f he was stabbed, but thankfully uh, the person survived. But historically speaking, I'm not going to go into the history because uh, I'm more of a current affairs person in terms of what's happening right now. So from that perspective, I would just like to say that uh, there are times which in which things can change. But uh, the government of Bangladesh should, what I can suggest is, should look closely deep enough into not just the central part, but also in the periphery, peripheral areas where the situation is, it's not that good. And uh, the word secularism should not be kept in the textbooks out there. It should be properly integrated. And uh, that should be reflected in uh, ways after, because elections are around the corner next month out there. And uh, from that perspective, politically, um, situation is still kind of, uh, in a way, not that uh, good, but uh, we'll wait for the elections to happen and then uh, see the results. Of course, uh, one can expect what the result would be. Uh, still, uh, elections are elections. So uh, I'll not waste any time further because I've, little bit taken on the political angle, but I think that more to do with the humanistic aspect of it. Um, I would request Bro uh, Deep, please, to take over. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hello and good evening. I think when I left journalism some three, four months back, I was telling my old boss, Kamlesh Shishot Singh, that I don't want to be in a newsroom anymore. Seeing the crowd here, I feel like I'm back in one again. Mm, when Ayanjit uh, goes to Dhaka, he meets people from Army League. He meets people from the government. Unfortunately, I don't have much access like him. So when I go to Bangladesh, I meet uh, people on the ground, mm, which serves me well, which has helped me write this book. But uh, long story, but this book began much before I thought of writing a book on Bangladesh. This book began with a voice in my head, a voice of someone I have never met in my life, a voice of someone who has been talked about in my family, not always in, uh, in glorious uh, words. He happened to be my great-grandfather, a man of much excess, a feudal lord, if you please. And, uh, you know, such, such was his... Uh, expansive ways that my father became an ardent socialist uh, in revolt. Uh, cut to 2023, my co-author Abhishek and I are in Dhaka. We make a tour to a place called Kolakopa village. It's a village of forgotten Hindu havelis. And I'm thinking of writing a story for the print because most of the houses are deserted. There are some houses that have been given to uh, college professors and principals and lawyers and doctors. But there are other houses, magnificent havelis, you know, which are just deserted. And I look at, look at those, those houses and I wonder that, you know, my great-grandfather and my family uh, must have had a house like this somewhere in Bangladesh. And I turn to Abhishek who tells me that it's, it's because of people like your grandfather, great-grandfather 
that the violence in Bangladesh in, uh, started in the first place. The partition violence was so horrific because there was this sense of othering because of the feudal lords, the zamindars of Bangladesh, Hindu zamindars mostly, uh, and, the, and their behavior towards the sharecroppers, both lower caste Hindus and Muslims, that when socio-politically the situation changed and it was becoming another country, all of it came out in the vicious violence against Hindus. <coughs> now, it got me thinking. I added that line in the story I did for the print, but it got me thinking. But then I also thought, and Abhishek later agreed, that if that was the, indeed the case, why did this gentleman called Jogendranath Mondol fail? Uh, many of you may not have heard of him. He happens to be a Bengali Hindu, uh, Dalit by caste, who was the first law and labor minister of independent Pakistan. Okay? And his line of thinking was the same. When the partition was happening, he told his community of Dalits that, look, let the upper caste Hindus go. They are the oppressors. They have traditionally been the oppressors. Muslims are our brothers. Let us stay back. Let us build a new country. We don't need to go. We are anyway the dredges of the Hindu caste order. So he stayed back. Many of his followers stayed back in what became East Pakistan. But soon after, I think the Muslims stopped looking at Dalit Hindus as Dalit Hindus and looked at them simply as Hindus. Those who did not convert faced the brunt. And waves of <coughs> migration took place from that side of the border to this side of the border, what is West Bengal. There was a massacre that happened in 1978-79, which was my first book, in a place called Marijapi. And a lot of people do not know that the two partitions, the partition on the western side and the eastern side, is, are fundamentally different. Because in the west, it happened one time. In the east, it continued to happen. And very few people, it's politically in inconvenient to speak about it. For various reasons, not going into that. But this book, I don't know whether Utpal is here. Utpal from First Post, he did a review yesterday. Very interesting line he wrote, refugee blood, that both Abhishek and I share, though we look at the problem very differently. But we have managed to sort of come together to do a book. But it's perhaps the refugee blood that was the entry point of the book. But this book is not just about people who left. This book is very much about people who are still there. Mm, Hindus who are you know, fighting elections, January 7 is the election. Several Hindu candidates, Hindus who have done spectacularly well in business, in public life. But it is also about the Hindu on the ground who may feel, uh, who does feel, that a sense of Hinduness is ebbing. This book is about that Hindu. Uh, beyond the Modi Hasina camaraderie, the great strategic partnerships that our two countries share, there is a sense of, sense of gloom and doom which Professor Barkat of Dhaka University uh, penned in one very, very uh, soul-searching and dreadful line that in 30 years from, from now, there will be no Hindu left in Bangladesh. So this is a Dhaka University professor. So that was the idea behind the book, to try and make sense of uh, where the Hindu in Bangladesh is today, in his head. I mean, of course, like I said, it's not as if attacks are happening every day. There's a friendly government in place. Uh, there's stated uh, political, socio-political ideology, secularism. So all of that is fine. But beyond that, this, whichever government is in place, are there changes, drastic changes in Bangladeshi society which has completely othered the Hindu identity? I'm very glad I have Sanjeev and I have Shekhar and, uh, and Abhishek, of course, with me. Sanjeev has been, uh, he has stood rock solid behind me since my first book. I, I remember, I, I did not know him then, but when Blood Island released and Kanchanda is not here, Kanchanda, Kanchan Gupta, uh, he organized a talk at ORF, Sanjeev was there, and he told me that you should keep writing. He, in fact, told me what to write, one book after the next, and this, he has been, he's always been the person to go to when I write books. Shekhar, always encouraging. Shekhar, Shekhar sometimes says on Twitter that I know Bangladesh very well. Actually, he does, but he just uh, is very lenient. And Abhishek, I could not have found a better co-author. Uh, Abhishek is a researcher. Abhishek's backstory is, uh, you know, I grew up in relative privilege. Abhishek actually 
felt the brunt of the refugee experience, and yet he made a career in academics, a brilliant one, and he has done his PhD in, uh, survive, um, uh, on survivors, Dalit survivors of the partition in Bengal. So, so we'll <laughs> dive right in, enough about myself. Sanji, first to you. I was uh, rereading your book, uh, The Revolutionaries, and uh, <coughs> taking notes, of course, like I always do with your books. But one of the things that struck me that so much of our armed revolution is located in that side of the border, which is now another country. Same, uh, same revolution story, same language, same culture, same music. What happened? Why is there so much othering of the Hindu today in Bangladesh? So let me uh, begin by thanking uh, both Deep and Avishek uh, for inviting me here for their launch. Uh, so a big congratulations, both of you. Um, yeah, big, big round of applause for them. Of course, it is traditional to uh, congratulate those who write books so that, uh, at their book launch. But let me say that this is a special one for me particularly because this is a book that really needed to be written. And this is really personal as well because I also am from my mother's side of the family, child of partition. Uh, my, my mother's family came from an area called Kushtia, which is uh, actually, Nadia district is actually a part of India. But one bit of it, Kushtia, fell on the wrong side of the river. So they ended up within sight of India, but being on the wrong side of the border. And so they became refugees. So my mother's family were, uh, were also refugees. So I, I mean, I, I am also a, a result of this story, so it's not just about that. And of course, that story, as you pointed out, the Eastern partition did not happen in one, uh, it didn't happen by Jhatka, it happened by Halal, and continues to happen today. So what happened is, of course, there was the initial exchange of population at that time. But then there were continuous riots after that, spiking, of course, in the events of 1970-71, leading up to uh, the liberation war. But then, since then too, this in dribs and drabs, um, relentless um, persecution has meant that this um, Hindu Bangladesh population has continuously been squeezed. And I personally, since my, I also come from that background, I think of Hindus in Bangladesh are Indians we left behind. They did not choose to be a part of some other country. And as I will discuss now, and you pointed out, they were a critical part, East Bengal Hindus were a critical part of the freedom struggle. You cannot understand the freedom struggle, particularly the armed revolt and the revolutionary part of the freedom struggle without the contributions of <coughs> the uh, Bengalis from East Bengal. And yet, at the moment of independence, these people who had really sacrificed life, limb, everything for um, India's freedom, themselves lost their homes. Their women were raped, they were killed, thrown out, and it was just horrific. And by the way, the other group of people who also faced this uh, and also had a major contribution to our freedom struggle were the Punjabis, who also got partitioned. And of course, it's not entirely by chance that an effort was made to partition these two provinces. The contributions then, of course, at the point of uh, independence, whatever happened, happened. But the, the sad part of it is what keeps happening afterwards. There is the, the story which you just mentioned of Joge, Jogesh Mondol and, 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 and how he, having stayed back in East Bengal and kept back a proportion of the Dalit population back in East Bengal, in East Pakistan, he then happily comes over and uh, after he realizes things weren't going co quite so well and moves to India and leaves behind his followers to essentially face the riots of the 50s, the 60s, and then of 71. And then, of course, there is this huge <coughs> event in 1971 which happens, yeah. <clears throat> the genocide leading to the deaths of 3 million people, the bulk of whom were Hindus. In fact, those very large proportion of it, those Dalit Hindus, who are the f followers of Jogesh Mondol, were the, the brunt of it. And then 10 million of them came in as refugees into India. Again, the bulk of it were Hindu. And 
that is the circumstances by the way in the middle of that there was there, there was a big cyclone called bhola there was floods so it was a really messy time that's when i was actually born that's the milieu in which i was born and there were these huge floods in bengal on both sides of the border and um, i was born in kolkata and my mother of course was shifted to the woodlands nursing home which still exists and i was born and so i get born and there is no sign of my dad so he's gone completely missing because he was put in charge in an area called bonga which is further north of kolkata where there were massive floods and there were millions of uh, uh, refugees standing you know knee deep in mud and so and nobody had any clue where he was and there was no thing so my for a week after i was born my mother had no idea where my dad was then a few days later she picks up a newspaper and discovers him on the front pages uh, walking knee deep in mud with indira gandhi who had come to inspect some of the refugee camps that's how she found out where he that he was still alive or dead or whatever so there is you know this is really a part of our story but it didn't end with that as well that continued further on many of these refugees did not go back after the liberation war back to their villages because remember everybody blames everything on the pakistani soldiers the west pakistani soldiers but in fact much of the violence was done in fact by their own muslim neighbors people sh should not forget this much of the rioting the raping the burning of houses was actually done in the villages to the hindus by their own muslim neighbors who were backed by the razakars and so on but that is what was going on and many of them simply did not want to go back to their villages the razakars though came from the from the east exactly. pakistani society itself so now what happened is that they began to drift around in various parts of india and of course they wanted to come back to bengal because they were unfamiliar with the dandakaranya and all these sort of uh, jharkhand and chatisgarh and other areas that they were being settled so what happens here is quite interesting because in the middle of all of this in 1977 i think it's 77 or was it 79 i think it was a 77 when the left front government comes to power yes. and the cpm comes to power but it comes to power along with a party that is now forgotten called the rsp the revolutionary socialist party now the revolutionary socialist party is an interesting party because it was once a very powerful party actually but was essentially the party of the revolutionaries of east bengal uh, they would have originally been the east bengal part of the awam uh, of the anushilan samiti the revolutionaries used to call themselves the anushilan samiti so the east bengal part of that anushilan samiti converted over time to uh, one part of it who became marxist ended up be becoming the rsp so now that there were all these people from east bengal spread over, over the rsp became effectively their natural political party and they began to and now they had come to the government and they wanted to bring these people in back into bengal so they lobbied and etc and also spread the word around in the refugees that come to bengal and we will uh, settle you somewhere which i am now going to link to your first book they were then sent to a they began to come in and then they realized that the 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 left front government had gone around promising all these things but they had absolutely no arrangements or or, in, or any intention of even helping these refugees so these rather desperate uh, refugees who had you know didn't know where to go ended up at the edges of the sundarbans in a island called muri jhapi and they began to settle there with the help of the rsp but Jyoti Basu took the view that this area suddenly having so many RSP uh, settlers would change the dynamics in favor of the RSP who were although they were their own allies were also another party so what he did was he got that island surrounded and then essentially carried out what can be considered the biggest state backed genocide in in uh, post independence india's history and one can take a guess of how many people died in it uh, it's somewhere between 3500 and 10000 you have also uh, written about this we don't really know and essentially you have these completely traumatized hindu refugees who had been thrown out of the houses in east bengal came to india were invited back to come to west bengal and then were essentially killed 
in Morijhabi. So I want to tell you this story because this is a story of repeated tra trauma. It's not just a one-time ethnic cleansing. This is a continuous process which carries on till, till, today, till to this day. And the story was so successfully all suppressed. I actually grew up in a government colony in Kolkata in the late 70s, early 80s, just at the time of when this Morijhapi events were happening. Many of those who carried out that genocide lived in my colony. And those who covered it up also lived in my colony. Many of their kids are now living in Delhi and giving gyan in liberal circles. But they were the people who carried out that Morijhapi massacre. They should never be forgiven. So with that, let me hand it back to you. Thank you, Sanjeev. Shekhar, I have mentioned you in the book. This, this chapter I wrote before I started working for you. Uh, Hifajat, how problematic is Hasina's understanding, whatever understanding Hasina government has with the Hifajat, and what does the future entail? The, the line I started with of Professor Barkat, do you think that's a possibility 30 years from now, no Hindu left in Bangladesh? Well, I, I think that's, uh, in a manner of speaking, it's possible. But it, I would say it's unlikely with a little bit of wishful thinking there. Uh, because as, as things move on, especially in the subcontinent, especially to the, to the east of India, and given the change in India as well, this seems less and less likely. Maybe if you had asked me 15 years back, I would have said looks more likely than now. Uh, there is a, uh, first of all, uh, congratulations to both of you for doing this book. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, there, is so, there is such a paucity of any reading on Bangladesh in India. Uh, <coughs> I spent three years covering the Northeast, including a lot of the issues that concern Bengalis from East, East Bengal or East Pakistan, but my understanding of Bangladesh has been very, very poor. I have not done even one reporting trip to Bangladesh. Uh, I might have done 25 to Pakistan, right? but not one to Bangladesh. Uh, one, because Bangladesh was never such a big story in India. Uh, sec uh, didn't quite have the same sex appeal as Pakistan. Second, uh, for a long period in Bangladesh, it was much tougher to be an Indian journalist or to get visas than in Pakistan. And third, uh, as a nation, officially Bangladesh was openly not of such trouble to India as Pakistan, also in the, with, given the overhang of Kashmir and Punjab. So, so my own knowledge of Bangladesh is very poor. So thank you for doing this. We need more writing on Bangladesh. And that's the reason uh, Deep's column is so valuable for us uh, at the print, because all of us are self-styled pundits. And you know, I say there are three categories of people. There are reporters in three categories of journalists. They are reporters, then there are thinkers, and there are thoughters. So thoughters are people who think they've thought everything through already. So this city is full of thoughters, right? So, uh, so it's, it's quite humbling to figure out how little we know about Bangladesh. And it's also bringing personalities from Bangladesh, social phenomena. I only read up about Bangladesh. I started reading up only as I got more interested in the politics now and the protests. Bangladesh is an, is an interesting uh, country uh, in the sense that, uh, I mean, I say in my politically incorrect moments, which is most of my moments, that if you draw a line from this coast of the, uh, of the Mediterranean to, to the other side of the Bay of Bengal, there are only two countries in which Muslims have a right to vote which matters. One is Israel at the other extreme, and one is India. Now people say, oh, but Muslims have the right to vote in Pakistan. Muslims have the right to vote in Bangladesh. The quality of democracy, it's by no means perfect in India. All demo every democracy is a work in progress. Freedom House, by the way, lists the US among uh, imperfect democracies. Right. Uh, so every democracy is a work in progress. In that situation for Bangladesh even to retain what it has retained, and for Bangladesh to have formally kept the army out of the power structure, uh, and for the army to formally agree to that uh, is, a, is a big blessing for the subcontinent. 
And I have sometimes worried about the possibility that India has an Urdu-speaking Pakistan to the west. What happens if we get a Bengali-speaking Pakistan to the east? And uh, in fact, uh, in the last year of uh, UPA government, I had written one column which was headlined, Dear Narendra Bhai. And what was this column about? The column was that there is a border deal pending with Bangladesh. Uh, UPA government doesn't feel it has the political capital to do it. It needs to be done. BJP will not do it because Sushma Swaraj and Arun Jaitley don't have the heft to do it. Narendra Modi is a leader on the rise. He should put his weight behind it and get it done with because you don't want a Bengali-speaking Pakistan to the east. So it's, it's, a, it's an imperfect society, an imper imperfect nation. Uh, maybe more imperfect, much more imperfect than ours, but the fact is that there is a, there is a system there which is, which is still acceptable and good for India. Uh, the alternative may be much worse for India, and the alternative may be much worse for the region, and it, it will be much worse for the people of Bangladesh than it is right now. So that is where, in fact, right, one more reason I'm getting so interested in reading about Bangladesh is that I see that the Americans, it looks to me as if Americans want to uh, be requested yes. to write that piece also. It's as if the Americans want an Arab Spring in Bangladesh now. You know, there's a whole bunch of Arabianists and Orientalists and Islamists and Persianists in the American policy-making establishment who have constantly, who built careers out of trying to quote-unquote reform Islamic nations and Islamic societies. In the process, all they are doing is breaking up one Muslim country after another. You see, what have, what, they, what have they done lately, besides whatever they might have done in the past? You see what they did to Libya, what they did to Syria, what they've done to uh, Iraq. Uh, in the process, they keep getting uh, Al-Qaeda and ISIS, et cetera, et cetera. Now, do they want to repeat something like that in Bangladesh? And from all the pressures that I've seen coming up, it seems to be headed in that direction. Looks like Joe Biden is too distracted. He has limited energy and attention spans. And then all the others are running with their own, own agenda. So that's why I think Bangladesh needs a great deal of focus. Uh, Hindus in Bangladesh, I think minorities in any country are very important. Because what minorities do is what diversity does anywhere. Minorities smoothen the edges of any society. Uh, People keep saying, oh, Pakistan will break up. I'd rather that Pakistan doesn't break up. Because if Pakistan breaks up, what will you be left with? Uh, the Pakistan, you are, suppose Sindh and Baluchistan and, and Khyber Pakhtunkhwa go away, you'll be left with Punjab, Punjab as Pakistan. That will be 65% of Pakistan's population, 90% of Pakistan's army, 100% of Pakistan's nukes, and 500% of Pakistan's, Pakistani Punjabis enmity for India. So you find that these minorities of Pakistan actually smoothen the edges of Pakistani society. The society, they balance, uh, they provide the balance. And that's why it's very important that Hindus are not evicted. Hindus stay on, of course, safely and as equal citizens. And India has to work in that direction. And for that to happen, it's most important that we acquire not just a better understanding of Bangladesh that is challenging, which will take time, but at least start looking at Bangladesh. Bangladesh is a country, it's almost a Pakistan-sized country to our east. It's a country that was a basket case 50 years ago. Today, it's almost 30% richer, 40% richer than Pakistan. Uh, and it's a very good example in the subcontinent, it's also a very good example in the Muslim majority nation. So we have a stake there, and that's the reason we must read more about Bangladesh, hear more about Bangladesh. There is too little coverage of Bangladesh in our media, and that's why books like these are a very good addition, and congratulations to publishers also. Abhishek. Is easiest question for you. Do you still blame men like my grandfather, or has your opinion changed? Well, uh, I got the difficult question. Uh, uh, but before answering this question, let me start by saying something else. I read a book uh, seven, eight years back. I read a book by Kathy Karuth. The name of the book is Trauma Explorations in Memory. Uh, and in the book, Kathy talks about a woman who wanted to leave after Hitler because 
she said that I want to leave after Hitler. I want to talk about the memories of Holocaust. Uh, since we began the book by talking about Nuakhali, I just want to mention this. We, we got Sriti Karna Vishras, that is my grandmother, yeah. who could talk about the experiences that she got um, during the Nuakhali riots. And my interest in partition and talking about partition actually sprang up from this. You know, I came to know about the stories of Nuakhali riots as I was growing up in a colony. Shonjip Shah was talking about one government colony. So was I growing up in a colony in the uh, 1990s. Uh, and now to come back to this question, um, I think the question already has been in a way discussed by Shonjip, uh, Shonjip sir. Uh, let me tell you this in a very interestingly um, simple, simplified manner, and that is, no doubt about the fact that I don't know about your uh, great grandfather, but the Hindu landlords um, in the eastern side of Bengal, um, they look down upon some people as mlechos. There is no doubt about this. This is historically, this is historically a uh, 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 fact. But at the same time, I would say that uh, this is not the only reason. In fact, this is not the reason after three, four years of partition. We were only talking about 1971. I would say the history of Bangladesh is having many folds, not just 1971. Let's, let's not forget 1964, the Dhaka riots. There are fictional tales about that as well. Even uh, Mitab Ghosh in Shadow Lines talks about 1964, Dhaka riot as well. So if you talk about 1964, if you talk about 1970 and 71, there are layers of genocides in Bangladesh or eastern side of Bengal or East Pakistan, which are selective genocide. Let me quote Archer Blood's telegram. Let's, let's, let's be uh, very vocal in terms of this. When I was doing my research, my supervisor was not in agreement with this. And I, one day, I actually crossed showed with her. And I said, I have to write this. If you want to cross showed with this, show me uh, your arguments. That is, I really don't want to see 1971 as a very simple tale of one uh, movement for lingua franca. I don't see this in that manner. That began as the movement maybe for lingua franca, where Bengali will be the lingua franca, but that went into something absolutely different. Let's not forget, Bengali mo language movement was not the only thing, because in 1956 or 7, Pakistan government had already accepted the fact that Bengali can be another language along with Urdu. So, after 13 years, why would people still fight over Bengali language? So this was also something else. Archer Blood sent two telegrams to US in 1971. The telegrams headlines are very important. Let's look at this. In March 1971, the first telegram he sent, Archer Blood, the headline of the telegram was selective genocide. He did not stop here. He sent another telegram to US in 1971's August. The headline of that telegram was even more direct, which was slaughter of Hindus. Archer Blood was not a Hindu. Archer Blood was not an Indian. He was a person from America. And he was sending these telegrams to Washington. The headlines were slaughter of Hindus. So when we are looking at, as Deepda and me have traveled in Bangladesh and have tried to understand the condition, the only fear that I've not just in the book, but we have shared this, is that are we by any means uh, getting back the gory days of 1971? This does not, um, this is actually not as simple as it looks now. Uh, because the history of Bangladesh has always been problematic. Let's, let's actually keep that in mind. A country that uh, in the first 25 years after its formation, the PM post got abolished for three times in a country. This is a country we're talking about Bangladesh, a country where the military rule was very significant in the first 25 years. We can't only, uh, we can't even blame the Awami League because that's true. There is one quote from the Home Minister in our book when he says that after the formation of Bangladesh, Awami League was not in power for a long time after the assassination of Mujibur Rahman, which is very true. After the assassination of Mujibur Rahman in 1975, Awami League came to power only in 1996. And by then, by 1996, a lot has been changed. For example, the word secularism, which was there in the constitution that the Mujibur Rahman uh, uh, formed, or his allies formed, the word secularism was abolished because the Article 12 of the constitution was abolished in Bangladesh in 1977, Jaur Rahman's rule. Next important thing is, we, uh, another interesting thing, I think uh, the house would be uh, eager to know this. We met one Nitai Rai Choudhury, 
who was the minister in the uh, uh, regime of Irshad. He was the member of Jatiyo party. Uh, he's thinking about the plight of Hindus. He says he's thinking about the plight of Hindus. But interestingly, Islam became the state religion of Bangladesh in 1988, when this was Irshad's regime of Jatiyo party. And Mr. Nitai Rayachodiri was the law minister. So the, the Islam became the state religion of Bangladesh. The word secularism was abolished. It was restored in 2010, after the Supreme Court of Bangladesh intervened. And that became a secular country. But the problem possibly lies in the fact that Bangladesh constitution has the word secularism, but their state religion is Islam. So the slogan, Dharmo Jarjar Utshab Shabar, which is like, uh, Everybody has their own religion, but the festival belongs to everyone. Uh, this is easier said than done. That's all I have at least realized while being in the process of writing the book. So not a very uh, great picture possibly lies in front of us, because the statue of Rabindranath Tagore, whatever has been going on, uh, and Deepda also did a story for the print possibly uh, around this. And I was actually talking to Deepda, and this is not just the present time. In 1961, which was the Bath Centenary celebration of Tagore, the Pakistan government banned the celebrations, number one. In 1967, there was a ban on Tagore's songs. My only fear is, are we by any means getting back to those days? Nobody wants to get back to those days. But the numbers of, I mean, the decreasing numbers of Hindus possibly points towards this fact because the numbers are decreasing every day. Every 10 years, the numbers are decreasing. That's the last point. In 2011, the Muslim population in Bangladesh was 85.8. In 2022, the Muslim population in Bangladesh is 91.5. 6% rise, fair enough. The Hindu population in Bangladesh in 2011 was 8.6. The Hindu population in Bangladesh in 2022 is 7.64 or 5.4. The statistics says it all. That's it. Shekhar, in uh, India, we often ask after Modi who, in BJP circles and outside among journalists. I think there's a similar question in Bangladesh, after Hasina who. Do you think, and I think the question is uh, more problematic in Bangladesh than it is in India. Uh, do you think there is a chance of the Jamaat uh, coming to power? In this election, they cannot the Supreme Court has stopped them from doing so. But do you think there is a, there's a chance that Bangladeshi society will be sort of completely jamatized? Well, Jamaat always lurks, lurks around the corner. Uh, I can go by experience in Pakistan. They always uh, command a lot more presence in the media, in our mind space, than, than electorally. The Jamaat and Jamaat-linked forces and have never got more than 6 to 7 percent of the vote in Pakistan, they contest. So I'll be surprised if they acquire power this way, but they could acquire power indirectly. They could acquire power through chaos or through a chaotic situation in which a dictator comes in, who then, uh, it, when a dictator comes in, dictator will need religion to, uh, to support their politics. Uh, I think the comparison with India is not quite correct because in this case there is a party. There is a well-established party with a working committee, with a central uh, election committee, with a parliamentary body, etc. In Bangladesh, it's much more uh, personality oriented. So I think the best hope for Bangladesh would be that she, uh, she nominates a successor, obviously will be from the family, and does it rather quickly because Bangladesh politics is around around victims of its past, right? Uh, everybody, everybody who matters in Bangladesh politics is a victim of that past. And Bangladesh has had very hard knocks. Uh, so uh, again, with a little bit of wishful thinking, I would hope that Jamaat, now you mentioned uh, Hazina making these, uh, these compromises. Uh, all politicians make these compromises at some point or the other because politicians think that I have the power when they are in power, I can use these guys, then I can get rid of them when I don't need them. But our experience tells us, particularly in the subcontinent, that they are not able to do so. Because uh, if you encourage these forces, forces like Hefazat, they, they grow bigger than you. And in any case, their street power is so overwhelming. 
in a democracy, in a populist democracy, street power also uh, has to be kept in mind. They may, may not be able to win any votes. Uh, there are parties, even in India, which will get, say, the left in West Bengal. The left in West, West Bengal may not win one seat. But if they held a rally in Kolkata, they'll look like everybody supports the left. They'll get lack of people, two lakh people, and I don't know how you count crowds these days uh, in rallies. Uh, so collecting a crowd in India is not difficult, particularly for a group or a party which is driven by extreme views and with, by religion. So this will always remain a threat. Given that situation, um, I think for now it will be better for, look, I just, I'm just completely, completely, completely confused by this idea that you could have a more perfect democracy in Bangladesh. What kind of democracy Bangladesh wants? It's for Bangladeshis. It's not for Americans. It's not for Indians. Uh, India can only look at its own interest, and India, when, when India looks at its own interest, India will say, what Bangladesh has right now is the best for us, right? Why should we? Why, sh why should we make any more experiments if we had the choice? Uh, but if we don't have the choice, why should we encourage a situation? And that's where I think the India-US relations are going to run into a lot of arguments going ahead because we have disagreements over Bangladesh, which is the biggest one, because our interests in Bangladesh and America's, America's not interests, I think some obsessions there clash. Uh, because it doesn't suit them if Bangladesh becomes friendlier to China or becomes more Islam Islamized. Our interests in Americas are clashing in Myanmar because they are with the Chin Kuki uh, refugees. Uh, India is not. So there are, uh, these are areas to, uh, for, to navigate, but India is the preeminent power here. And India has, uh, India, in, India carries weight. So I hope that, uh, that after this election, if the re results of the election are what they seem to be, what, what they are expected to be, uh, Sheikh Hasina one finds a successor so that it creates a notion of stability and stops palace intrigue. Otherwise, palace intrigue will set in. And second, she does course correction because ultimately what, what will eat her up is not the army. It will be uh, street, uh, the street power of Islamist forces. Having said that, I will just add one more thing which I should have said earlier. Partition. The part, our understanding and reading of partition is very much focused on the Western side, northern and the Western side. So there is much more literature, much more reading, much more understanding of the partition of Punjab. So it's almost as if in our collective memory in the country, partition only took place in Punjab. Uh, partly it's because, partly it's because partition, partition was total there, as Sanjeev said partly because it's close to Delhi, or maybe it's a combination of all of that. And that's why I think it's very important for us now to understand the partition in the East, because the human cost of that partition was no less severe than the human cost in Punjab. Sanjeev, there is, of course, the great love for Hilsa. There is uh, common food, culture, uh, music, films, and now OTT. But uh, beyond that, why do you think the Kolkata Bengali Hindu is so oblivious to the suffering next door of the Bangladeshi Bengali Hindu? Very good question, actually. And as, as I said, um, this is something I've thought about for a while. Because in general uh, conversations, partition comes up all the time. Because there is a very significant proportion of the population that is of uh, partition origin uh, on at least one side of the family. And there, are, there were lots of them. And even for those who have no parentage on the other side, I mean, it was obviously a major shock that happened right next door. So, and uh, given the um, population demographics changes of recent times, this is also not something that is, people are oblivious to. But they can clearly see what is going on even today. So this is something that happened for a long time, has been a part of the conversation. What is interesting, however, is that Bengali elite, however, has somehow managed to keep this conversation, this partition story, the fate of the, Bengal, uh, uh, the Hindus on the other side, out of the general conversation for a long, long time. And I've also wondered why. One of the reasons, among many, is that you have to see who became Bengal's elite after independence. It's quite interesting. It was not those who fought for independence. 
like, in fact, that is also partly true of all of India, but particularly true of Bengal, it was essentially the collaborator class, those, the, the class which had collaborated with the British, that became the elite of post-independence Bengal. So if you see Jyoti Basu and company, he hadn't lifted a finger to, uh, for uh, India's freedom struggle. But he became India's long, uh, Bengal's longest serving chief minister. And if you look at the, some of the earlier ones as well, they, were, they had minimal, uh, even Bidhan Roy, he was a part of the Gandhi faction. But, you know, people don't remember this, but he, were, he was one of those who was vehemently opposed to Netaji Subhash Bose. Yeah. So, the elite of post-independence Bengal was largely derived from the collaborator class. And of course, they retained power afterwards also by eliminating, as with the case of Mori Jhapi, etc., people from the other side of the border. So the poor cousins from the other side of the border were an embarrassment. And of course, they didn't want their own past to be dug up too much. People don't realize this. It's only relatively recently that Netaji is being as celebrated as much as he is. I mean, he may be a major figure, generally, but there was almost an embarrassment even in the 1980s to celebrate Netaji. Because remember, the communists had opposed Netaji and, and, and the Azad Hindus. So there was an entire, somewhat of a bizarre uh, relationship with, uh, of the elite, Bengali elite, with the freedom struggle and with their cousins across the border. And so they kind of suppressed the whole thing, and some of it deliberately, as I said. I mean, I grew up in a neighborhood where many of those who carried out the Maurit Jhapi massacre lived. I didn't know about it till much later. In fact, it was after reading a book that I went and referenced up and looked up who carried out these things, and I discovered, oh my god, this is my neighbor. <laughs> so these are the, this is the, what happened in Bengal. And of course, what they did is in order to sort of distract the population, they then turned on the Marwadi population, who they then said is the evil capitalists and chased them away as well. So this is the politics of the, 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 the way in which Bengal's elite clung onto power by essentially um, not getting evicted after independence, which is precisely what you would have expected, at, you know, independent country throwing out all the guys who collaborated with the colonial power. Instead, they entrenched themselves further and further in. And they, I mean, they are really the people who, who, who came to dominate, uh, you know, Bengal since then. And so Bengal suffers from this um, to this day. That's not very different from West Pakistan, where, yeah. the, where the collaborator elites became the Zamidars and Rai Bahadurs, etc. And then they came to uh, um, uh, Delhi and settled in Sujan Singh Park. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sir, uh, Sanjeev and Shekhar both. Uh, See, interestingly, the people who actually ruled Bengal, the western side of Bengal, most of them came from the eastern side, the leadership. Not really. Uh, means historically, the eastern side became the elite. The, I'm not talking about the Shudra Lok, but if you see No, Bhadra Lok, a large proportion of them are West Bengal, <laughs> and many of the communists. <laughs> were West Bengal Bengalis from Kolkata specifically. And, but, but Look, they I had some from the other mm. side too. RSP mm. is the guys who were from the East and they were wiped out. But is there, because recently I've read uh, mm. an article, last year only, I think Chandra Bose had uh, written this piece. Is there because of this, uh, you know, kind of construct around Bengali nationalism and Indian nationalism? Still, there is a talk about you know the larger Bengali identity superseding this religious identity, and uh, many a times talking to uh, Bengali scholars, uh, academicians, I find this you know resonating. So this this actually, by the way, happened to be there even at partition. 
right there was a, a proposal by the way of bengal becoming a separate country in its own right absolutely absolutely and suravardi had reached out to sharad bose mm -hmm. who was the elder brother mm -hmm. of netaji mm -hmm. and they had actually made a proposal which went quite far um that um, bengal will become independent and later on choose which side to go now when this proposal was put by suravardi and sarod bos the idea was i think that suravardi would be the prime minister and sarod bos would be the president and it wasn't written out but that was the understanding but it was very very clear very quickly that the idea basically was that you have to take the entire province and join pakistan and even if it was a separate country you know what happens to hindu minorities a little bit later so uh, with that realization sp mukherji suddenly raised the hackle saying that look look no why, why not should we be set off to a separate country we want to be a part of india so in fact my family has a history in this also he reached out at that time to somebody called nalinaksh sanyal who was my great grandfather who was the chief whip of the congress party mm -hmm. in the bengal assembly and he then split the uh, the uh, bengal congress to vote in favor of a separate west bengal for which sharad bos never never forgave him and they were never in speaking terms ever after that so even in the bos family it's very very interesting you had an ultra nationalist subhash bos and then you had a person who quietly in exchange for being made some position quietly was willing to sell off his soul to become uh, you know big, uh, to create a separate country called for, uh, bengal and uh, to sign up to subnationalism shekhar i would like to have your take on this why you also mention eastern side was neglected two people in fact in constituent assembly talked about it one was shama prasad mukherjee the other was dr ambedkar while resigning so why we are you know uh, neglected and even now we are neglecting you also said you on the reporting career pakistan obsession but not that much about bangladesh what what is your take as, as a well i mean the second part is easy to answer because bangladesh was not actively as a nation of trouble to us to india and uh, with pakistan we had active problems we had uh, we had uh, we had punjab and we had kashmir which was always an active problem and pa with pakistan see all our wars were with pakistan none of our wars was with bangladesh nor even with east pakistan 65 war which took place when the country was together uh, there was no fighting on the eastern side for whatever reason there was no fighting the fighting was confined to the western side so uh, so the eastern side did not feature in our national i am only theorizing what do i know uh, on partition mainly because of how complete partition was at this end and also partition on the western side northwestern side was very uh, violence was very bilateral so both sides had a story to tell so no no side wanted to hide the story of that partition so each side produced their literature each sides produced their movies each sides produced their folklore and that's why you also have partition museums etc coming up again i'm theorizing i don't know for sure as for my not having traveled very much to bangladesh i would have liked to but the story wasn't quite there remember in 1985 when i first went to pakistan pakistan's per capita income was 65% higher than india's so when pakistan was 65% higher than india's in 1985 how much lower bangladesh would have been at that point of time so bangladesh wasn't that important a country for a whole number of reasons Uh, so bangladesh was a forgotten neighbor for a very long time which is a, a regret but it was a forgotten neighbor there was very little coverage of bangladesh even of all the coups and instability that took place there there was very little little, little coverage uh, partly i'll blame also the kolkata media for it if kolkata media had covered it more actively and had paid more attention to bangladesh which was next door to them uh which would have been as important for them and as interesting for them as say punjab was for delhi based media then there would have been a greater understanding but you know uh, if some if a nation in our neighborhood does not give us trouble 
uh, we don't talk about it. So the example I always use is that when I was posted in the Northeast as the Indian Express correspondent between 1981 and 83, three years, I lived in Shillong. But in my three years, I did not write even one front page story from Shillong. I might have run the odd, done the odd feature about somebody who was making little paperweights and things from, a, from, from butterflies, which got banned later. But nothing else, because and my friends in Meghalaya will ask me, even in civil services, police, so Shekhar, how many of your Indians do we have to kill for you to get a front page byline out of Meghalaya? But the fact is that what is not giving you trouble falls out of sight, out of, out of mind. So that is, uh, I, I, I'm just giving, I'm just thinking aloud, but I wish we had paid Bangladesh more attention. Uh, I wish we had politically paid Bangladesh more attention. I wish our political leaders had paid Bangladesh more attention. So I think we, we found our leaders either being patronizing to Bangladesh or, or treating it with benign neglect. Even if you look at the history of our visits to Bangladesh, and in the process, see how much the Chinese have done in Bangladesh. Bangladesh Navy is driving a Chinese submarine, right? Uh, we gave one to Myanmar. We could have given one to Bangladesh. Who knows? Because those are all old uh, Russian Soviet submarines that our Navy doesn't want anymore. So, so, so there was, I think there was almost two decades of uh, indifference to Bangladesh. Uh, hi, my name is Saswat Panigrahi. I'm an independent journalist. Uh, my question is uh, addressed to the entire panel. Uh, if I'm not wrong, Hindus have also contributed in uh, creating Bangladesh. Uh, but now Hindus are fighting for their own existence in the country. Given the vicious circle of uh, um, violence in the country, but uh, in Bangladesh, and the d dwindling number of uh, Hindus in Bangladesh. Is there any hope for Hindus in Bangladesh? I will take the, I mean, it's for Shekhar and Sanjeev to answer, but you know, the universe works in mysterious ways. Uh, sitting right next to you is a gentleman who's a Bangladeshi Muslim who has uh, taken up the task of reconstructing a 300 year old Kali temple in Magura district where he comes from. So I know that's what the answer to the question that, that maybe I read about the read about that read on about the, print. It in the print. Yeah, <laughs> the, yeah. But please, I mean, more seriously. So what he's doing is he, he's. I mean, we are just providing a platform. So what he's doing is he's building a bridge that should should always have existed uh, between India and Bangladesh in terms of our understanding of that country. We, I mean, how much do we know about Myanmar? We share such a large border with Myanmar. The stability of our northeastern state depends on what happens in Myanmar. We know nothing about Myanmar. In fact, I don't even know any Indian journalist at this point who's traveled to Myanmar yeah. to do a proper political story, even after the coup, etc. So it's a, you know we now only look at huh? print the Beijing. Nibu be bejeng in the course of time, but print. Uh, per, uh, no, 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 कुत्ते को भी डर नहीं लग रहा इंसान को भी डर नहीं लग रहा लेकिन हमारे जो रिपोर्टर वहां जा रहे हैं फैंसी ड्रेस में तो आ, तो हम नए ऑर्गेनाइजेशन ऑर्गेनाइजेशन है लिमिटेशंस है द अदर लिमिटेशन आल्सो इज टू फाइंड द राइट काइंड ऑफ जर्नलिस्ट विल ब्रिंग यू द राइट काइंड ऑफ स्टोरी बिकॉज़ यू डोंट वांट अ जर्नलिस्ट टू गो एंड टॉक टू फेलो जर्नलिस्ट एंड ब्रिंग यू अवर स्टोरी सो नाउ दैट वी हैव डीप इन बांग्लादेश वी गेट coverage of a different uh, quality. And similarly, if you can find something in Myanmar, I don't have anybody who knows anything about Myanmar. Because if I did, uh, we'll send people. Uh, hello. You're absolutely right. I mean, uh, uh, see, I mean, which is more, I don't know how to count. I mean, uh, which force is uh, gaining prominence, you know, we can, like Shekhar says, we can only hope. But uh, Shahidul is not a solitary example. 
you know, you tend to think that cities are more secular than the villages. It's not so. In villages in the remotest corners of Bangladesh, I have found, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's a much abused word now, secularism, but I have found very meaningful coexistence between communities for generations still, despite what's happening maybe in the neighborhood villages. So, you know, in one village, there's a Waj Mahfil, where perhaps the guy who's addressing the crowd is saying all kinds of things against women, against also the kind of Muslim you need to be, okay? Uh, against Hindus, of course. In the next village, maybe you will find something that's not very tom tom an example of very peaceful coexistence, example of people from the minority community, uh, which is the Hindus in this case, being helped by the majority community, which is Muslims. Even today, Durga Puja is celebrated with a lot of pomp and grandeur across Bangladesh. Nishant has been in one of those trips with me. And uh, in villages also, you know, peop uh, you, you will see, it's, you have to go there to see it. You will see uh, women in burkhas, you know, sitting outside of Durga Puja Pandal, uh, seeing what's happening and with, with a lot of interest, taking pictures. So you can't unsee those things, you can't deny those things, those are also happening. However, can you broad base and say that's the story of Bangladesh? No, you cannot. The threat is real. Like you said, the threat is real. I cannot, uh, I cannot, I cannot say, that. I mean, Sanjeev, Sanjeev Shekhar can, I cannot say which is more, which will overtake which one. But they both exist parallelly. So we had a statement from uh, Bangladesh Home Minister that don't Asad Zwan Khan, yes. There was a the, yeah, yeah, but, but so there is a fear. There is fear among Hindus community that there's always a fear. There, come Durga Puja, there's always a fear. Look, this is election year. I mean, to, uh, January seven is the election. So obviously this year there's extra security, and there there were not there were no deaths <laughs> reported deaths. There were some attacks, but uh, of course there was a lot of security this year because 2021 was a like it, it stood out. A lot of anti-Hindu violence. But so you don't know, there's always a threat. But to say that is, this, I mean, it's how much population of Hindus are left. So if there were, it was actually that acute, right now there would have been no Hindus left. Right, so, uh, so but I'm not extrapolating, you know. The problem is you see this one thing, two thing, and you say, okay, this is how it is and the rest is fringe. I'm not saying that. But neither am I saying that it's all gloom and doom, everything is over. I, I uh, just, I'm just taking, uh, taking this line from Deepda and to answer your question. Uh, I'm the last person to comment on the political picture of Bangladesh on this panel. But I would just take one thing and that is, um, I hope that's not too political to comment on, but I think uh, if you look at the picture of Bangladesh in the last 23 years, starting from 2000, the biggest uh, uh, year of Hindu migration, you know, and the Hindus started running from Bangladesh was post-2001 election, after BNP came into power. I hope I could answer your question in, a, in an indirect manner. What I'm trying to say is, possibly the last hope, and that's not I'm just building castles in the air. We talked to many Hindus in Bangladesh, for them also, despite all their criticism of the recent Awamili government, their last line was, possibly for them, Sheikh Hasina is the last hope for them. How far it, it is true, we should, uh, we should be uh, rehearsing more about the reasons, knowing about the reasons. That is a different question. For them, Sheikh Hasina is the last hope. What they are uh, sort of hoping is there is no hard right Islamic party in Bangladesh. For example, like BNP, backed up by Jamaat, because that has been the scenario uh, uh, many a times. That is the only thing. So as long as Sheikh Hasina is there, possibly the Hindus are going to leave uh, because and uh, that that's the only hope they have I guess I guess after that uh, after Hasina uh, Deepda asked a question after Hasina who I would say after Hasina what for the Hindus that should be the more relevant question after Hasina what for the Hindus Bangladesh once to trace back my 
you know, roots because both sides of my grandparents were refugees. And uh, the one, the first thing that like really stood out for me, and it was really shocking for me and my brother was to see those temples, like you know, small small temples, uh, in the uh, uh, like semi-open places and in villages, which were all caged up. There were collapsible gates in front of the idol. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, so that is like, you know, that is the first thing we saw because uh, you could not go up to the idol or, I mean, you know, they were all because, and that we came to know later was to uh, stop the desecration. So that was 2017 that I visited personally. So when, when did that start? I mean, I'm sure you, you've been there multiple times. No, I'll, 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 I'll request Sanjay and Shekhar to answer this, but I'll tell you something that my friend Rahul Pandita said about the Delhi riots, the last Delhi riots. He said he went there to report the riots and he uh, went to the shop of, uh, of a gentleman uh, which was charged completely. And he said, what happened? So the gentleman said that, Aapcho hai ho, hi hua hai. So if you want to say that Hindus have attacked Muslims, that has happened. If you want to say Muslims have attacked Hindus, that has, ha has happened. So I think what we see sometimes is also what we want to see. But having said that, it's a very, uh, very important question. Uh, I think I'll leave it to Shekhar and Sanjeev to answer it. Look, we have already just discussed this, right? The point is, let me be very, very clear. What is, you know, saying that the Jamaat is only get 6% of the vote in, in Pakistan, for example, is a ridiculous thing. Th their average, supposedly middle of the road uh, party, the kinds of statements they make about minorities, specifically Hindus, whether it's Benazir Bhutto or Imran Khan or whoever it is, just listen to the comments they make. So the Overton window is already there in extreme. Right? It, you don't need the Jamaat to be in power in order for extreme behavior towards the minorities. So already what has happened in Pakistan, Afghanistan, of course, the entire population is gone. Um, that will happen a little bit later in Bangladesh. Bangladesh, unless something very dramatic happens. Of course, there's always an opportunity of something dramatic happening. But a population that has gone essentially in the in last 75 years from 33% of the population to 7.5% of the population clearly is, as far as I can see, in one direction. Now the question is whether it stabilizes here, which I doubt. Now the question is if something else changes. But if if we ha if the last hope herself is now, I don't know how old Hasina, uh, 76, and there is no obvious uh, uh, successor, and in any case, at some point in time, the political tides will turn. And we know what happened the last time the, the other, another party was in power. So I think let's be very realistic about what, this, uh, what the situation is. I don't have anything, I don't have any knowledge to add to this, except to, to tell you the nuance of our editorial position on CAA NRC. We make a distinction between CAA and CAA in combination with NRC. So CAA is the example I use is like a rocket, right? On a rocket, you can put a payload or a war load. You can put a bunch of satellites, you can put Chandrayaan, uh, Mangalyaan on a rocket, or you can put an ICBM, a nuclear missile on a rocket. So NRC CAA combination is the problematic thing and you cannot implement it. It will not happen at least in my lifetime. But you, can, you can keep using it now and then for politics and whoever makes that promise knows that they are not going to be able to implement it. Uh, so that, that said, that explains our editorial position. Second, uh, second what will happen in Bangladesh, 7% of a nearly 18 crore population is not a small number of people. It's almost 2 crore people, right? 1.7, 1 1.8 crore people. It's a lot of people. It's like a Calcutta-sized population. Now, uh, are you then going to be resigned to all of them migrating to India as refugees and finding place for them? Okay, you might, if that is the only thing to do, what kind of lives will they lead? It's not easy to be a refugee for any generation. Even refugees who came from West Pakistan really suffered in that generation. Then they built their uh, fortunes and their children and grandchildren have done well. So it's tough to be refugees. If we are a big powerful country, which is becoming bigger and powerful by the day, as it looks like, we should have sufficient leverage and influence and power to make sure that this does not happen to a section of the population. 
in a much smaller country in our neighborhood. And for that, you don't have to, don't necessarily have to send armies to ensure that. There are a hundred other ways of doing it because how, how does a nation exercise its power? This is not like, this is not like the Pakistan of the 1960s. 1965 onwards, a bunch of Hindus left uh, Pakistan and came to India. That was the last migration from Pakistan. Uh, but Bangladesh, I don't, I, I think if, in, 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 from Pakistan, no, hardly anything, no, 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 hardly anything, maybe a few, maybe a few hundred, not more than that. That's why, that's why the, uh, see we are losing our way, that's why the UPS uh, repromulgation of Enemy Properties Act had got a lot of people very upset, uh, and I'm surprised that this government has not revisited that, uh, that action as yet. I don't know why. But that said, uh, that's where we are. I, I don't have anything more to add. Possibly, uh, there's a, there's a uh, very uh, popular book which is Blood Telegram. If you read Blood Telegram, you will find interestingly, there was no official acknowledgement of the number of Hindu migrants who were coming to that other part of the border. Government did not even acknowledge that this was selective genocide. The government did not acknowledge that there was slaughter of Hindus going on. There are many stories supporting this, so the government did not support. And uh, uh, Shanjeev sir was talking about one thing, and that is about 1971. Uh, I keep traveling to places, uh, uh, and I keep meeting people. I met one Bibhuti Bhushan Bishar, who presently stays in Bangladesh, in Gopal Ganj. Uh, and I was just talking to him and uh, during my research years. And he told me something very interesting, very uh, emotional, but I think that can be a part of the historical study. And that is, he said, uh, I was just seven, six, seven years when 1971 happened. And I came here with my father. We stayed there in, near Salt Lake, in a sort of refugee camp type kind of thing, temporary camp. And we went back to Bangladesh. We said, I don't know how far this is possible uh, from the constitutional frameworks or something like this. But he said, my father and forefathers should have gone to Indira Gandhi looking for, uh, you know, a citizenship. Uh, my father should have gone to Indira Gandhi asking for citizenship here. We shouldn't have gone back to this country. He was pr saying this out of frustration maybe, but he is still living in Bangladesh. He wants to call him a Bangladeshi citizen, but he still believes that possibly my father didn't do the right thing by going back to the country. So Indian government possibly didn't have any role to play at that point of time because they did not acknowledge the fact that there was a selective genocide going on. See, after Bangladesh uh, came into shape, this was a very dream state on a serious note because this was a state which was secular. This was a state which was uh, uh, sort of willing to be a very secular state. The constitution was formed in this manner, but there was a constant uh, pressure from the other side of the coin as well. And so many things which were sort of uh, abolished by Mujib had to be brought back by 1974-1975, especially after the assassination. In fact, in, in fact, that that's a function of us not having uh, track Bangladesh, because seventy one, I was, I was, in senior school then. I was older. I'm older than all of them. So seventy one war. I was fourteen years old. So I was reading newspapers and uh, I was listening to radio. There was no TV then. There was a lot of talk on 
atrocities specifically on the minorities in East Pakistan. Uh, it was also the talk in my household, and where were my parents talking about this? They were reading it in newspapers. Magazines then were very popular, Hindi magazines, Dharmiyog, Saptahik Hindustan, those are the ones we used to read besides a couple of English papers because we were a Hindi medium household, so my parents made sure we bought at least two, two English newspapers and Illustrated Weekly of India, right? So at least we could learn some English. So all of that, Illustrated Weekly of India, actually had a whole series of what Mascarenhas was he? Uh, Anthony, Mascarenhas. Anthony Mascarenhas. His articles, the entire series was published there. <laughs> now, how much was the spread of Indian media? Uh, what were the readerships? There was no news television. Uh, radio was all, All India Radio. There, there were limitations to that. But there was an un understanding, and that's an understanding in our oral history and our collective memory that Hindus particularly had, were particularly targeted. That is one. Second, if you see the constitution that Mujibur Rahman produced, first of all, it took his time producing a constitution. He should have done it earlier, but the constitution that he produced was, you couldn't ask for more if that constitution was going to remain, and that's the reason he did not survive. That's the reason he did a few silly, silly things. Uh, that is, you should catch hold of these two someday, and they'll explain to you how he cried, tried to create another political force which was even more left. And in the process, India was going through its own instability with a JP movement, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The Pakistanis took advantage of that. And remember, what was Bangladesh's army? Bangladesh's army, the officers, the officer corps were people who had mostly fought with the Pakistani army, alongside the Pakistani army, at least in 65 war. Some, I think Zia had even fought in the 71 war. Uh, Zia, I no, think. No, he had switched sides. He had switched sides in 71. He switched side, but one of them was still, uh, or he was detained maybe in 70 minutes. He switched sides and he was detained. The other, Arshad, one of them was actually decorated in the 65 war, fighting for the Pakistani Special Forces, the SSG, the Special Services Group. And they had brought their regimental loyalties and their uh, army loyalties and the idea that the army must rule, right? So it was very easy, the slide from a democracy, from a liberal, secular democracy to an army rule in Bangladesh, which then, uh, which then completely reflected Pakistan, because by that time, uh, Zia had the other Zia. So we had two Ziaocracies, one in the West, one in the East. And everything Mujib had done was completely forgotten. And then it took this long after that for the word secular to be restored, and that through by using the court route. So that country has also had a very complex history that we are not very uh, well aware of. And I think by 75, in fact, Mrs. Gandhi used the assassination of Sheikh Mujib to justify her imposition of the emergency. Uh, my question is uh, directed to you, Sanjeev. Um, you know, the world over, we've seen a lot of genocides happen. Some of them have been acknowledged. Some of them haven't. For example, you have the Nanking genocide that the Japanese did on the Chinese. You have the Armenian genocide. And then you also have a lot of genocides that have been acknowledged. For example, you know, the most famous and popular one of them that everybody likes to talk about, the Holocaust. Um, so, you know, there are a lot of documentaries that are coming out and uh, the world over there's this, um, you know, these Nazi war criminals are being, um, uh, you know, they are being sent back and, um, there are cases that are going on, or you know, um, even today, uh, there, there are people who've been extradited, there are people who've been hunted down. Um, you said that after reading Deep's last book, which was about the Morijapi incident, which not a lot of a lot has been um, uh, written or spoken about. I read about it the first time in the Hungry Tide by Amitav Ghosh. It's just um, very you know touched upon, and then he of course you know spoke about the oral history. Um, and you said that when you did a little bit of research, you could actually trace down the perpetrators. What stops the government from taking action against these people? If it can be done with the Nazi war criminals, why is it that we cannot... I mean, it, and it's seen, you know, there are hardly any people who've ever been punished for having committed genocide. Even the Nuremberg trials, you know, when you had... Uh, yeah. 
क्या आप सो वॉट इज इट दैट स्टॉप सो आई एग्री विद यू एंड बाई द वे यू नो दी जैपनीज अस्ट्रोसिटीज इन चाइना मोर देन यू आर मोर देन रिमाइंडेड अबाउट दम इफ यू गो टू चाइना सो इट्स नॉट दैट दे हैव बीन फॉर्गोटन इन चाइना and acknowledged and the japanese can do whatever they wish but the nanking is more you will be more than told about it so it is very well acknowledged i the problem is that the 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 uh, first the massacre and the 3 million killed during 1970 70 71 period and of course in the previous uh, decade or so uh, the 56 65 whatever the various riots the genocide essentially of hindu bengalis has simply not been properly documented and that's why this is such an important book we are you know no no i'm talking no no i'll come to that too you're talking on mori japi i'll come to it this is a long story this is not a short story this starts long back going back even before independence to things like uh, noa khali the great calcutta killings and so on and so forth and so there is a lot of kgness about the whole thing and of course it is not talked about because globally many of our again i'll go back to our own elites who like to you know go to harvard and uh, uh, pen and uh, mit and so where uh, they, they, they and you know they have some great difficulty as you recently found out that if their donors happen to not come from uh, from come from come from the countries where they think that genocide happened and they keep rather quiet about it so uh, the the west was entirely complicit in many of these genocides so therefore they kept entirely i mean there was 1971 i mean uh, the us the uk all of these guys were complicit so therefore you never hear about it at all and the same thing is true of morichapi the in the Beng uh, the uh, bengali elite of kolkata of that time was entirely complicit in it and ironically when uh, uh, didi came to par she had actually promised an investigation which didn't happen either because they, after that uh, of course she became a darling of the same bengali kolkata elite and specifically say kolkata elite it's not even a bengali elite and so it has never been done and i think it should be done there should be a proper investigation into who carried it out and who they are and as i told you um, many of their descendants are now people who lecture me on secularism in my whatsapp groups the guy who got it done was the longest service uh, longest serving chief minister of the state while he was there so but the, the officers many of them and the, and those who covered it up it was not just the those who carried it out there was a you know a lot of cover up after that and many other massacres that also happened the killing of anand margi is another yes. sai wadi massacre etc so you have to understand that the uh, morij jhapi massacre was only one incident the biggest one admittedly but there were there was a flurry of them and the officials who for oversaw uh, uh, all of this are many of them are still around mera prashna sanjeev sanyal ji se inhone ek sangathan ke bare mein bataya tha anufilan samiti ha to jahan tak meri jankari hai ise dr hedewar bhi jude hue the to is sanstha ka kya hua is sanstha ko banane ke piche kaun se log the लंबी कहानी है उसके बारे में मैंने एक पूरा किताब लिखा है कॉल रेवोल्यूशनरीज जो आपको बाहर ही मिल जाएगा <laughs> आप कैसे बाहर जाएंगे मैं साइन कर दूंगा आप पढ़ लीजिए this is daily as long as you can pass the buck yes, you pass yes, the buck yes shekhar sir will do after wasting bangladesh <laughs> yes shekhar is usually popular in bangladesh by the way they keep asking me about you then will you go and do a cut the clutter from that that should happen but thank you uthal great to have your review is great wonderful review got uh, thank you shahid in a bit of a spot <laughs> From 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 my very limited travels to Bangladesh, I can tell you, any time you are in Bangalore or Bombay or parts of Delhi, and you think this traffic is impossible, yeah. go to go to Dhaka, go to Dhaka. You will come right back. That's terrible. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.